Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. It's always a glorious day to read the words of Neville Goddard, and we have a delicious lecture today. This one delivered on April 12th, 1971, The Hidden Secret of God. Neville was an amazing metaphysical teacher who taught these remarkable principles and ways of understanding biblical truths and our awakening within the hidden secret of God. The mysteries of God are mysterious in character, yet they are proclaimed to all who can understand them. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, you read this in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, he is telling them a story that their faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now he speaks of a different wisdom altogether. He said, Yet among the mature we teach wisdom. It is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, for they are all doomed to pass away. 1 Corinthians 2.6 he speaks of an entirely different wisdom that he claims to be the secret, the hidden secret of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorifications, 1 Corinthians 2.7. Then he said, For what person knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which dwells in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2.11. Now we are told, after the resurrection, those who were closest to him did not understand him. For when he appeared, they said, Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you wait until you receive the power which will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That is the power of which I speak. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then, with that power, you will be my witnesses, witnessing in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, but not until it comes upon you. And when it comes upon you, you are told the Holy Spirit is one's remembrance. He will bring to your remembrance all things that I have told you. The whole will come back, and then you will actually reproduce within yourself my story. That's what he is telling them. He now disappears. He has now revealed to them the true exodus, that the exodus of the Old Testament was an adumbration, a foreshadowing. Resurrection followed by the birth from above is the true exodus from this world of tears, this world of bondage. So the Jews celebrate the exodus, and they are still in bondage, and the Christians celebrate the resurrection, and they haven't yet been resurrected. That whole thing is a drama. When the Spirit comes upon you, which is the Spirit of power, then he will bring to your remembrance all that I have told you, which I have received from my Father. So within the individual upon whom this power comes, which is the Holy Spirit, the whole thing will unfold within him. They completely misunderstood it. And they thought the restoration of a national theocracy was what was intended with the coming of Messiah. They did not realize that the truest coming of Jesus was the manifest power of the Holy Spirit. That when this power comes, it lifts you up from within yourself, and then you actually are the being that the world yesterday celebrated about his resurrection. You are that one spoken of in scripture, but you will not allow it, and be a witness to this until the power comes upon you. And that power is the power of the Holy Spirit, then the whole thing unfolds within you. Now you have heard the story, you all know the story. Did you ever dwell upon the character called Judas? Today we speak of a man who is a betrayer of a trust. He is a Judas. He simply betrayed the trust, any kind of a trust. A man just died in New York City in prison who betrayed the trust of the Mafia. He was one of the leaders of the Mafia and he gave to the FBI the true name, Our Thing, Cosa Nostra. No one claimed his body. There he was. He died in prison because there was a price on his head, a fabulous price to kill him. So he was protected while he was in prison because he had revealed the secret of this thing that wormed its way into society called Our Thing, where they made billions that you could not put a finger on it. Therefore, it wasn't taxable, but he betrayed it, so he was a Judas. Well, that is not the Judas of Scripture. But who is this Judas? We are told that at the Last Supper he said, The one to whom I will give the sop, for my time has come, 
Everything was done on order in the Gospel of John. He never moved. He resisted all action until the right moment. My time has not yet come. Beginning with the second chapter, he said to the brothers in the seventh chapter, My hour has not yet come. He goes through the entire book stating that the time has not yet come. He is following a divine plan. So here we find predestination in one, and we find free will both joined together in man. He teaches man to exercise free will and shows them how to change the pattern of life. But he is under compulsion to fulfill the Father's will. Everything must be done on time, so the moment of betrayal has come. In the Oriental custom, two would sit on divan or couch. The honored guest was always the one to whom the host gave the sop. He would take the sop, dip it into the dish, and then hand it to the honored guest. So the one to whom I give it, he will betray me. He turns and gives it to Judas, and Judas goes out quickly, and he said to him, What you have to do, do quickly. It is perfectly told, may I tell you. I know from experience. What you have to do, do quickly. And the Judas goes out. Yet they do not understand who it is going to be who will betray him. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Well, it is obvious, the one to whom he gave it. Who, then, is Judas? He betrays the messianic secret. Now, no one knows the thoughts of God, but the Spirit of God. Is he not, then, the Spirit of God? If he betrays God, only the Spirit of God could betray God, for no man knows the thoughts of a man, but the Spirit of man, which dwells in him. And no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God, but the Spirit of God. Then is he not the Spirit of God, for no one can betray me but the spirit of myself. Now we are told there are two traditions as to his death in scripture. Matthew tells it in the 27th chapter that he went out and hanged himself. In other words, he committed suicide. Jesus is made to say, no one takes away my life, I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. So here we find the suicide, the parallel. But in the book of Acts, it is said, he swelled up and swelling up, he bursts in the middle. Then all of his bowels came gushing out. Acts 2.28 They were two entirely different traditions, one given us by Luke, for Luke wrote the book of Acts. And then we have the one in Matthew. Now a friend of mine, he is here tonight, he said, This happened to me a year ago. I didn't tell it because I didn't know. It seems so strange to me. But this weekend I was reading the 13th chapter of the book of John, reading the Last Supper, reading all about the sop reading of these things and I wondered what nonsense they saw where he gave the sop to whom he gave it why ask all these questions is it I is it I and then one whispered to ask him who it is the honored guest could not be across the street the honored guest would be right next to him the one whose head was on his bosom and he dipped the sop and gave him and said what you have to do do quickly now he said a year ago I had a vision and in my vision I saw you dead you were dead you were dressed in white, radiant white, and your bowels were completely out. That was your death. Not understanding it, I hesitated to mention it because it struck me at the time that that would be Judas. And so I saw you dressed in white, radiant white, and you were dead, and your death was caused by the swelling up and the bursting in your middle, and out came all of your bowels gushing out. Here was Neville, and he was dead, and he saw the perfect vision. I tell you, when it happens, everything in you, all you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow, Blake from Jerusalem. So all these characters are within himself, and the nearest to him is the spirit of himself, which is Judas. The word Judas is the same as Judah, the one mentioned in the genealogy. And speak of the genealogy, Jacob was the father of Judah, and his brothers, Matthew 1 2, it didn't mention the first three brothers. It never mentioned the first three. It jumps over the first three and goes to the fourth one, Judah. Judah means the hand, but it's the hand of God, the power of God. It's the creative power of God, the directive power of God that can fulfill his purpose. And his purpose is to give himself to man. The story of Jesus is the biography of God. That's God. Now, when that unfolds itself in man, God has succeeded in giving himself to man. That man then tells it. So today, here we single out an individual as though this thing happened on earth. It didn't happen on earth. 
This is God's plan. It is all written in Scripture when it happens in you. You read Scripture to find the parallel, but the whole thing is taking place in a supernatural world all within you. He speaks to man through the medium of dreams, but he reveals himself in vision. It is God unveiling himself. So one who comes into my world, and no one comes unless the Father within me calls him, he has a vision. He hesitated for quite a while to tell me because of the tradition concerning Judas. He was the one whose bowels, as he swelled up, he burst in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. He was the one who betrayed the secret, as I betray it every time I take this platform. I am telling you the secret of God every time I take this platform. I am playing the part of Judas every Monday and Friday night. I play it every time I talk to a friend. If they call me on the phone, I am betraying the secret. I have come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So I tell you the law. I reinterpret the law psychologically and tell you that an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. Two thousand years ago, you heard that same statement told in this manner. Whatever you desire, believe that you have received it and you will. It's the identical thing told in a more modern form. The same thing, if you dare to assume this, that or the other, and persist in your assumption, it will harden into fact and project itself on the screen of space. That is the law. It's psychological. Now the prophets, they predicted the sufferings of the coming one and told of the glory that would be his. First, he was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Well, you can't take these five terms and come to any other conclusion than predestination. That is, the spirit in man fulfilling the will of God, leading that man up to God himself. For the story of the gospel is God's biography. When that story unfolds itself in the individual in the first person singular and present tense experience, now it's his biography. And if it's God's biography and it is his experience, then who is he? He is that power. When that power comes upon him, he is power. And who is the power of God? Jesus Christ. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. When someone now puts his or her hand to the plow and turning back, he unfits himself for the kingdom of heaven. But the one who called him will not allow him or allow her to unfit himself or herself for that kingdom. And so if he appears to her or to him as sheer power, it is for a purpose. As we are told, if one will not believe having been called and having been spoken to, as told us in the story of Gabriel, Luke 1, 18 through 23, and Gabriel came into the presence of Zechariah and told Zechariah that the Lord had sent him and then told Zechariah of the coming of the birth of John. And he said, how will I know this? I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. That is, wherever the messenger is sent, God is with him. For the sender and the sent are one. And the word Gabriel means either the power of God or the man of God. You can translate it in either way. So now you want a sign. Well, this shall be your sign. You shall be silent and unable to speak until that day when this thing is fulfilled. And when he came out of the temple, he could not speak. And those who waited on the outside in prayer while he lit the incense on the inside were dumbfounded because they knew something had happened when they saw him. He couldn't speak. He was dumb. Then, when the child was born, and then on the eighth day, which was the day now to be circumcised, they want to know what to name the child, and they thought certainly Zechariah, after his father, after he made signs for he could not speak, to bring him a tablet that he could write, and he wrote on the tablet, his name is John. And as he wrote, his name is John, the whole thing was fulfilled. His mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and then he spoke. That was sheer power. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. But in this world of ours, when I am put into the piece of playing such a part, in his infinite mercy, he takes from my conscious reasoning mind that individual act that I am not left with it, that I will play in the depths of my own being. I will play anything that my father who is one with myself commands me to play that they who would now stray from the path will be brought back into it if that little thing was only for one moment 
that you are dumb, unable to speak, and here for one moment there was no speech. But I tell you, this play is the eternal play. It didn't close yesterday, when the bowl overflowed and all of a sudden they came out, when they reinterpreted the entire story and called it positive thinking or positive decisions and all this nonsense. This is the eternal story. Wait until you receive power from on high, for the power will come and you will be overcome with the Spirit the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it will bring to your remembrance all that I have told you. And what have I told you? My life. I've told you exactly what happened to me supernaturally. That will then happen to you individually, and you will know that I told you the truth. That is the eternal story of the gospel. So when he said among the mature, I too impart a wisdom, it is not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, for they are doomed to pass away. I impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glorification. That's what he imparted. Then he tells us in the same chapter, the second chapter of First Corinthians, how it's impossible for any person to know a man's thoughts except the spirit of that man which dwells in him, and therefore no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And so he sends the spirit upon you. So the real coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, in the truest sense, is simply the manifested power of the Holy Spirit. That's his coming. He can't come in any other way. He becomes invisible. He departs this world and then sends the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit comes like the wind, may I tell you, just like the wind. And when you hear it, it's the most unearthly sound you have ever heard. But it's the wind. It possesses you. And then you wake. You wake to find yourself entombed. And then you come out of the tomb where you have been buried and then everything, the entire story now unfolds within you, scene after scene without any deviation. And that's the being that you are. When it happens and it comes to the very end, you know who you are. You are God himself. You are the power of God that is Jesus Christ. The power of God and the wisdom of God. And now you know the true exodus from bondage. What you read about in the Old Testament was only an adumbration, a foreshadowing. But when it happens to you, this is the true exodus, when you are set free. Set free because you have found the Son. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, and the Son stands before you, and you know exactly who He is, and He knows who you are. So don't close the book and wait for a year. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the unveiling and the revelation of Christ in you, for that's where He is. He is all buried within you. In the meanwhile, use the law psychologically. External observation means nothing. All the outside ceremonies mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's all just, well, that was my command when I was sent down with the blue buds. All church protocol, that's what it means. Down with it completely. Pay no attention to it. Even to the little simple thing, which is a very pleasant thing. When you sit down to dine and someone calls upon you to say grace, say grace. Don't be abusive about it. Say it. But you know it means nothing. But do it if you are called upon to do it. We do not have it at home. We sit down and I thoroughly enjoy my meal that my wife prepared. And I thank her for preparing it. But if one calls upon you to do it, do it. But all outside ceremony means absolutely nothing. That was my command when I was sent. Down with the blue bloods. Down with all church protocol. The so-called kissing of the feet that you saw in the picture the other day and the washing of the feet of these 12 elderly men kissing their feet, that's out. It hasn't a thing to do with real, real Christianity. I tell you what is from experience. He will awake within you. And then you will know every one of those disciples, what aspect of your own being each represents. And that one who was closest to him, the one who was his friend, the one to whom he gave the honored place, that was Judas, the hand of God, the directive hand that could fulfill his purposed end by betraying the secret. As I do every time I talk to you, I betray the secret of God. I can't betray it if I don't know it. No one can betray what he does not know. And so one must first know it to betray it. But I am betraying it. I am telling you exactly how it happens, it happens in the way that I have told you. It will come suddenly upon you, the Holy Spirit. It will come like a storm wind. And when it comes, you will wake to find yourself entombed. And then you will find the innate wisdom, for Christ is also the wisdom of God, not only the power of God, to move that stone from where it, 
The Shoes of the Fisherman by Morris West was. That was the seal. Break it by pushing it from within, and you will come out, and you will find surrounding you the witnesses to the great event that God succeeded in his purpose, which was waking you as God. For this is the birth of God, not born of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And you come out, and the sign of your birth is present. And here is the sign wrapped, as you are told, in swaddling clothes. And you pick it up, and in the most endearing manner you say, How is my sweetheart? And the whole thing vanishes, including the three witnesses who witnessed the birth. Then comes the second great event, when he stands before you, and you fulfill scripture, the 89th Psalm. I have found David, and he has cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And then he stands before you, and this relationship is forever. It's the returning memory, for you do not have the feeling that it happens now. It's simply that your memory has returned, just as though you had suffered from total amnesia. It's not something that startles you. You've always known he was your son. That's the feeling that I had, so all of a sudden he comes back. What comes back? Well, the Holy Spirit is upon me. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? He who brings to your remembrance all that I have told you. And did not David in the Spirit call me my Lord? Well, when he calls you my Lord, which is the name of the Father, for all sons called their father and spoke of their father as my Lord, so David in the Spirit called me my Lord, he does it in spirit, not here on earth. And then comes the grand severance of your body from top to bottom, and your ascent into heaven, separating the event called resurrection from the ascension. And you can count them. It's not any 40 days. You can count the whole thing up. It's between mine was on the 20th of July of 1959 and the ascent took place on the 8th day of April of 1960 and that's when one ascends, ascends into heaven and the whole thing as you are told reverberates like thunder and then comes the seal of approval on the 1260th day and that is the descent of the Holy Spirit in bodily form as a dove and here he rests upon you. You bring him up and he is smothering you with kisses when the whole thing fades and then you come and you tell it. And so the story of Judas, when he does betray, he does it quickly, I tell you. You are seated on the floor explaining the word of God to those who are seated before you. And he is one of them, and suddenly he jumps up. And you know exactly what he is going to do. He is going to tell. You don't use the word betray. He is going to tell exactly what he heard you say. You are speaking of the kingdom of God. And he is going to tell what you are speaking of the kingdom, and that you are the king. And he is going to tell the authorities concerning what you said. He has to betray the kingdom, and he goes out and he tells it. Then comes the authority in, and he avails your arm. And his name who went out is the arm of God, the hand of God. He unveils it, and you see the relationship between the one who went out and yourself. Now you are completely unveiled when he nails into your shoulder the peg, that wooden peg, and hammers it in, and then takes off the sleeve and takes the arm and it's bare. And then you know the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. And as everything is placed upon that being, he has then to bear the burden, but he will see the travail of his efforts of his labor, and he will rejoice. He will be satisfied when he knows that he got through. So you can say to anyone, if they see me in any role that seems a harsh role, then know that I consciously am not aware of it while I played that part. I have to play it. For this is a supernatural world of which I speak. It is a supernatural being of which I speak. It is a supernatural part that I am playing when I play those parts at night. And certain parts I am relieved of the memory of them, for they have to be done to jack one up, having put his hand to the plow and turning back unfits himself for the kingdom of heaven. Luke 9.62 And what caused him to turn back? Doubt. They questioned. And so when Zechariah said, How will I know this? I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. How could she conceive and bear a son? He said, I stand in the presence of God. In other words, I am speaking for the one who sent me. And he never left me. Therefore, he stands with me. Now sheer power is going to make you dumb. And so he said to him, You will be silent, unable to speak, until that which I have foretold has come to pass, because you did not believe the words that he gave me to speak. I spoke them, but you did not believe my words. So you will see me in many roles. Many of you have seen me in different roles. Yet my conscious reasoning mind has always been removed on my 
return from certain parts that I had to play, for I am under compulsion to play those parts after being awakened. And my friend had to see me in that role to know who Judas really is, and I am Judas. Every time I betray the messianic secret, and I am the one who told him to do it quickly. That scene I recall vividly. What you have to do, do quickly. He certainly did it quickly. There was no time between his departure and the arrival of the authority who came in and severed my sleeve and hammered into my shoulder that wooden peg on which he then placed the burden. So I tell you, this play is an eternal play. It goes on forever and forever and forever. And each one makes his exit, which is the exodus from this world of tears into a blissful state. But only in that way does he ever make the exodus. So when they sing the hymns of how they were led out of bondage in Egypt into a world of freedom, and yet all are still as enslaved as they were thousands of years ago, then what are they commemorating? For when the real leader, the new Moses, comes, they would not recognize him. The new Moses came and he was called Jesus, which means Jehovah. God himself came this time in the form of man. And that's the new Moses. And his life is the pattern that man will one day imitate, actually experience, and therefore it's his pattern. It is his. And it's the only way you will ever make an exit from this world. Death will not take you out of this world. You will die and be restored to life just as you are now in a world just like this. It's terrestrial, and you will be making your effort as you do it right now. There is no transforming power whatsoever in the thing called death. There is no transformation in death. You find yourself the same being, young, yes, but that's not transformation, the same identity. But that of which I speak is a complete transfiguration, a complete transformation of form. You are no longer this little garment. You are glorified, and you wear a glorified body that doesn't have the needs of this body at all. And wherever you go clothed in that body, everything is perfect. There is no place you could go. Walk through hell, it will become heaven. And someone clothed in these garments, walking through heaven, would turn it into hell. So I tell you, you are in for the most glorious thing in the world. And what I have told you, I tell you from my own personal experience. I'm not theorizing, I'm not speculating. I knew that someone had to see me in that role and he had this vision a year ago, but because of his custom and his association with the idea of Judas as the one whose bowels, first of all, he swelled up and swelling up, he burst into the middle and all of his bowels came gushing out. And loving me as he does and believing me as he does, he didn't know how to associate that with the one that he so loves and trusts to tell the truth. Well, I can tell you, they are the same being, for he is the spirit of the one, the honored guest to whom he gave the sop. This is the honored position, not a rounded table, as we have it here in da Vinci's picture. There was no table, not in the oriental world. You sat on a divan, not more than two at any one moment, and divans were around, and the host, if he ever dipped it, would take a piece of the meat and dip it, and the one to whom he gave the meat or piece of bread, that was the sop, the one to whom he gave it. That was the honored guest. As we today, sitting around the table, we seat the honored guest to our right, and here, that is the honored position. But there, the one whose head was on his breast, and he just simply said, who is it? Who is nearest to you but your spirit? So no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God but the spirit of God. So if God was ever betrayed, he can only be betrayed by the Spirit of God. It had to be revealed. It could not be discovered by any philosophical reasoning. No man in this world, as you are told in Scripture, man could not find God. All the wisdom of man could not find God. God had to reveal himself. And the revealing is the betrayal of God. He betrays himself by unveiling himself to man. And this is the story, as it is written and told us in Scripture. You set your hope fully upon that moment in time when it comes to you, it is called grace in scripture. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, grace is simply an unearned, unmerited gift of God to man. And that gift is God himself. So you are raised from the level of being a son to the level of being the father. At the end of these lectures, never will we get two minutes of silence. Now let us enter the silence.
This is most definitely an important lecture. And one of the reasons I read it is that this is confirmation of the Frank Carter lectures. Be sure you check out my episode on We Have to Talk About the Death of Neville Goddard, where I discussed the Frank Carter lecture, something that I read for a little bit earlier on my channel, and then I had to remove them. Frank Carter was Neville Goddard's driver, and it described his own experience in witnessing the death of Neville Goddard. When he went up to his room, his daughter had called Frank, and so Frank was asked by the police to walk up to the room, and when they showed him Neville's body, Neville was described exactly as the Judas that's described in this lecture. His bowels had all come out of him from the middle, and the description that is given is sort of haunting, because we know if that's the vision that Frank Carter had, he had seen Neville Goddard's death exactly how it would be, burst from the middle. When you check out that episode, that's how Neville Goddard died. All of the blood came out of him and it was burst in the middle. But he was so shocked by his vision of Neville that he didn't tell him for a year. And then he tells him and Neville says, yeah, I'm Judas. Kind of shockingly. And what a crazy thing to say, I'm Judas. But when he explains it, he's Judas, the one who betrayed the messianic secrets. And he did. He has described the secrets to becoming the son of God, to be an awakened spirit to be an awakened being by dissecting and unlocking the meanings of the Bible through his own personal experiences. So he's speaking to Frank Carter, who is at the lecture, and this is confirmation that Neville did have this experience from Frank Carter. So Frank Carter wasn't making that up. We have confirmation from Neville that this experience happened. So it's quite interesting and somewhat supernatural that that is the fact. I'd love to get your feelings on this and what your impressions were of those Frank Carter lectures. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. I'm imagining love and happiness for everybody today, hoping that your day is joyful and welcome to The Reality Revolution.